Amidst the unfolding of ancient prophecies, a foreboding sign drifts upon the winds, foretelling the fate that befalls the Noldor. The first omens of the doom pronounced by Mandos darkened the hearts of the Noldor, as Feanor, driven by his own inner darkness and betrayal, turned against his half-brother Fingolfin and abandoned most of his kin on the distant shores beyond the great sea of Belegaia. Nonetheless, Fingolfin burdened with shame and consumed by a terrible anger upon witnessing the distant flames, chose resolutely to press onward into Middle-earth, refusing to return to the blessed realm of Valinor. Yet he had no other path to tread but the accursed one, where the influence of Melkor was felt most. The treacherous icy wastes once lay betwixt Araman and Middle-earth in the farthest reaches of Arda's northern lands. But after the tumultuous War of Gods, all the earth was sundered and Helcaraxer became an area of broken and shifting lumps of ice, veiling the northernmost reaches of the Great Sea. While the followers of Fingolfin struggled to traverse the polar icebergs, tidings were at hand, which none in Middle-earth had foreseen. For no news of the coming of the Noldor came from Arman. A Feanor had come over the sea with a force and landed in Drengist, a long firth which pierces the echoing hills of Arid Lomin, which were the western fence of the great land of Hithrim. And soon as they set foot on the ground, their cries rose to the hills and multiplied, so that the tumult of countless voices filled all the coasts of the north. For to the north of Drengist lay Lammoth, a domain bestowed with the name the Great Echo. It was there that Morgoth and Ungoliant sought refuge, driven by the pursuit of the Vala. Ere long, Morgoth unleashed a baleful cry that reverberated through the rugged mountains, and its echoes found eternal solace within that land. Henceforth, whosoever dared to raise their voice in that forsaken realm would awaken a chorus of anguished wails, cascading throughout the barren expanse between the rolling hills and the restless sea. And so it came to pass that in that very place, which came to be known as Losgar, where the Firth of Drengist yielded its waters, perished the fairest vessels ever to grace the seas, in a great burning, bright and terrible. And the flames were seen by the orcs and the watchers of Morgoth, and the noise of the burning went down by the winds of the sea. Far and wide echoes were spread, and the Sindar elves of Beleriand were filled with wonder. None could fathom the thoughts that consumed the tyrant entrenched beneath Thangorodrim. Upon learning that his most bitter adversary had arrived from the west, thus delaying his relentless campaign to conquer Beleriand. Although Morgoth had suffered the defeat in the east, at the other end of Beleriand, Phallus was falling under siege and there was no sight of Thingol Greymantle yet. Morgoth did not want to risk and wait for all his enemies to unite under one banner. His plan was to crush the Noldor, focusing on smaller elven forces, before they could firmly establish themselves and forge alliances with their long-lost kin. An orc host that had occupied East Beleriand and besieged the havens of Phallus in the south was recalled to join the attack, thus ending the siege, while a vast army of 40,000 orcs was sent forth from Angband in an attempt to surprise the Noldor over passes in the Mountains of Shadow. When the host of Feanor has passed from the shores into the inner regions of Hithlum, they march to the northern end of the Mountains of Mithrim amid the lake where they encamped. But of a sudden, under the cold stars, the host of Melkor, orcs and trolls and werewolves, came through the passes of Ered Wethrin and assailed the Noldor before their camp could be strengthened or put on a defence. The 
Thus began the second battle of the wars of Beleriand on the grey fields of Mithrim. And it was the first meeting of the might of Morgoth with the valour of the Noldor. Dagor Nuin Giliath it is named, the battle under the stars, for darkness had dominion over Arda. Though the orcs greatly outnumbered the elves, they were unable to coordinate an attack and take advantage of their full combined power. The Noldor was strong and swift, and they turned the tide of the battle quickly, for they were empowered by the light of Armin that shone in their fair faces and their swords were long and terrible. But the fatal blow to Morgoth's forces was the hitherto unseen Nolador cavalry, which charged from the hills upon the orcs. With their wondrous weapons and gleaming armour, fueled by a fierce wrath, the Noldor launched a devastating assault that shattered the enemy's resolve. In the wake of their onslaught, a gruesome slaughter unfolded upon the battlefield. Despite their desperate attempts, many orcs fled in vain, scrambling back over the treacherous mountains in a desperate bid to join the reinforcements advancing from the south. However, even with this glimmer of hope, they proved to be no match for the resolute Deep Elves of the West. Orcs that were overwhelmed in Mithrim were now retreating northward through the Great Plain Ardgalan, and Feanor was close behind them in furious pursuit, chasing after them with the great part of the cavalry. When the armies of Morgoth finally united, they tried to resist the Noldor, but the path to the north was blocked by Kelegorn, the third son of Feanor, who lead his huntsmen and come down upon the enemy. Out of the hills near Ithil Syrian, his force drove the orcs to the fen of Serech. There, the great hound Juan filled the orcs with terror, and those who encountered him tried to flee but in vain. For Kelegorm was a great huntsman, and a friend of the Vala Orome, from whom, in the days of his glory, he received Juan as a gift. From Orome, he had also learned the great skill with birds and beasts and he could understand some of their languages. Trapped between Kelegorm's forces and the Fen of Serech, most of the orcs stood their ground in a great battle that lasted ten days. Then a terrible slaughter befell the orcs and the ponds were stained with their black blood. All but few of them perished, but in the midst of this brutal strife, Feanor, consumed by a fervor unmatched, pursued the remnants of the orcs. Across the vast expanse of Ardgalan he charged. Blinded by his fervor, he chose to abandon his host, entrusting his fate to the valiant few who remained by his side. Unbeknownst to Feanor, the winds of fate shifted ominously, and the tides of battle turned against him at the very edge of Dordadiloth. From the dread depths of Thangorodrim, the abode of Morgoth, a horde of Balrogs surged forth, encircling the valiant elf in a suffocating embrace. With his sword raised high, Feanor, undeterred by the impending doom, waged a valiant struggle, his blows cleaving through the darkened forms of his foes. Then Gothmog, the Lord of Balrogs, laid upon Feanor his baleful gaze and inflicted grievous wounds upon the resolute elf. Yet, even in the throes of mortal anguish, the fire within Feanor burned undiminished, his blade carving a path through the encroaching darkness. But in the end, Feanor fell, fatally wounded. Then the armies of his sons reached him, 
and the orcs and balrogs retreated. The sons raised up their father and bore him back towards Mithrim. But on the slopes of Ered Wethrin, Feanor bade them to halt, for he knew that his hour had come. Looking over towards Thangorodrim, he knew with the foreknowledge of death that the elves unaided would never throw down the dark towers. But he cursed Morgoth thrice with his final breath and left his seven sons to fulfill the oath and avenge him. At the moment of his death, the passing of his fiery spirit reduced his body to ashes and he was borne away like smoke. An embassy arrived from Morgoth, acknowledging their defeat and presenting terms, which included the possibility of surrendering a Silmaril. Maedros, the eldest son of Feanor, and now the inheritor of the claim to the kingship in exile, held a deep distrust towards Morgoth. However, he also yearned to bring an end to the enduring troubles of the Noldor and the torment inflicted upon them by the terrible oath. Both emissaries sent more than agreed upon, but Morgoth's numbers were greater, and he sent Balrogs. When the two groups met, the elves were quickly slain, and Maedros was captured. Morgoth then sent word to the elves that Maedros would be freed if they gave up the war against him. But the Noldor knew that Morgoth would not honor his word and sent no reply. In response, Morgoth hung Maedros by the wrist of his right hand to the face of a precipice of Thangorodrim with a band of unbreakable steel. But while the world lay in wonder at the first coming of the moon, Fingolfin and the second, greater host of the Noldor marched southward into Lameth, where they were surprised by orcs who were sent by Morgoth to attack Feanor in the rear. There, the people of Fingolfin fought their first battle, the Battle of Lameth. In some tellings, the Battle of Lameth is counted as part of the battle under the stars because of its outcome, which was affected by the moves that Morgoth made during the battle with Feanor. The orcs made an attack upon the elves, who were caught off guard and began to give way due to the great suffering in the crossing. Things were going sorrowfully for the Noldor until Argon, Fingolfin's youngest son, dashed forward and cut a path to the commander of Morgoth's legion, whom he slew. Although the orcs surrounded and killed Argon, his brave deed turned the tide of the battle, and Fingolfin with his host pursued the orcs until they were completely destroyed. Tilion had circled around Arda seven times while nature slowly began to wake. But as his vessel plunged into the waters of the encircling sea, Arion stirred the sun for the first time upon the heavens of Arda. While the Noldor were passing through the land of Mithrin, Anar flamed in the west like a great fire and Fingolfin unfurled his blue and silver banners while blowing his horns in rejoicing. Then indeed, Morgoth was dismayed, and he descended into the lowest pit of Angband. All of his servants were filled with terror, and Fingolfin passed unopposed through the fastness of Dor Daedaloth, while his foes hid beneath the earth. The elves then struck at the gates of Angband, and the challenge of their trumpets shook the very towers of Thangorodrim, but there was no answer. And thus, amidst the mingling strands of courage forged in the fires of undying hope that bore witness to the weight of doom and enduring sorrows, the first age of the sun began. It was a time of great deeds where the valor of the children of Iluvathar blazed forth like stars in the firmament, illuminating the path of fate that lay unveiled before them.